Today's video is sponsored by Rich Reviews. Rich Reviews now provides services to support our viewers in purchasing their own dream supercar. Our services currently include pre-purchase inspection, support calls and collection video to document you collecting your own dream supercar. More information in the description below. Hope you enjoy the video guys. Hi everybody, welcome back to the channel, welcome back to Rich Reviews and welcome back to our 458 Spider. Now today we're on a longest journey up to Sewell Aerodrome for the Ferrari Owners Day meet. So we thought it would be a good idea to do a video to cover off what are these cars like to actually drive on a long journey? How do they deal with these long journeys now? We would class this as a modern day supercar, the 458. Modern-ish supercar. Some people think it's sort of like a classic supercar, but really it's the modern day supercar. It's the, it's the first really range of, of reliable supercars. So let's see how this car performs this long distance journey. How comfortable is it? How does it drive? Is it dangerous to drive? Does it deal with it quite well? Is it comfortable? Do we end up with back pain? Um, what's the performance of the car when we're driving a long distance? Is it jittery when we're in slow traffic? This sort of journey really tells the story of what these cars are like to drive on a daily basis. You never really drive them on a daily basis, but this will give a good perception. So we just stopped off for a coffee. So first point, coffee cups. <laughs> so on a long journey, you're gonna be getting drinks. And as I mentioned before in one of my previous videos about the, the in effect, the pros and cons of the interior of a 458, the flipping coffee cup holders are next to friggin' useless in a 458. To fit, I've got a large Starbucks coffee cup, similar to the one that Jacob's just shown you there. And the best, you've got two coffee cup slots, but only one of them is really a coffee cup holder. The other one's just a shallow um, holder for bits and bobs, it would seem. Um, and the first main coffee cup slot is impinged by the air conditioning and heating controls. So you have to be very careful when you leverage the cup in there, otherwise you spill the whole freaking coffee all over the console of the car. Terrible design, terrible. You're gonna be drinking coffee or you're gonna have hot drinks or you're gonna have cold drinks in these cars. You know, get it sorted. I mean, Porsche can get it sorted. They've got fantastic push and, and, and uh, withdraw coffee cup holders these these lovely little slim items that then fold out when you when you um, when you push the when you push the drawer and they come out and it's all automated how they come out and unfold Ferrari could do that why don't they do it I guess Ferrari yeah um, but anyway first first bone of contention there um, may seem a stupid thing but whenever you do these longish journeys this journey is about 100 miles there 100 miles back You're gonna be wanting a drink, of course you are, you know? Um, anyway, I'll shut up now, get off here, I'll get off myself, Bob's. <laughs> now, it's been damp all the way driving in, so Manatino on wet. Don't try and be a hero and drive these cars on sport or on race when it's, when it's wet. The car is designed to have a wet mode on the Manatino for a very good reason, because it increases the traction control sensitivity, and it softens the suspension, it automatically puts the car in what's called bumpy road mode, so it softens the suspension, so it makes it more agile and more uh, tractable on the road for wet conditions. So use the wet mode, don't try and be a hero. You see these people, you know, on, in race mode on a car, in a supercar, in wet conditions, and of course they spin off and have problems. I mean, the, the, the tires are gonna be cold, the, the car's in a performant mode, in an edgy performant mode, just don't take the risk. It's 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 performant enough in race. In, in, it's performant enough. The car is performant enough in wet mode. If it's if it's damp, use bloody wet mode. You know, it's a no-brainer. Anyway, I'll stop banging on about that now as well. Um, so, cars in wet mode. It's actually drying out now. It's supposed to be a dry day in Sewell, but unfortunately, in the southwest, we come from the southwest in Wiltshire. But unfortunately, in the southwest, it was wet and it was actually raining when we left. So. You know, the roads were damp and it was actually raining, so got used to windscreen wipers and that. Yeah, it's a pain in the ass driving the car when it's in, in wet conditions. The car's gonna get a little bit wet. It's fully PPF'd, so it's fully protected, but it still is an, is an annoyance. You can't get away from it. It is an annoyance when, when you keep the car immaculately clean, which means we're gonna have to wash the car when we get back. I'm gonna have to dry it off properly. 
Um, but that's just how it is. You realise as you get older in life that when you've got nice things like this, you either do it or you don't. And if you don't do it, then you don't do it. Don't get those experiences. So there is a lot to be said for just driving these cars. I mean, I try and keep the mileage down in this car as much as possible, but for the channel and for enjoyment, we drive the car. It's a car. But we try and keep the mileage down, so we try and we try and keep the, the, the best of both worlds with it. So, excuse me if I'm if there's a bit of a gap between me talking because I'm just obviously navigating uh, where I'm going as well. Obviously, with these new laws as now with, with cameras. Uh, sorry, obviously with these new laws with regards to mobile phone usage, um, you've got to set your GPS now and never touch it. So you're not allowed to wake up the phone. You're not allowed to look at messages. You're not allowed to tap the phone to wake it up to, to look at up or to look at other location bits and pieces of information while you're driving. So. We have to make sure, uh, which of course I did beforehand, you put everything in the phone beforehand in the GPS system. You literally just put the GPS system in the car, switch it on when you just before you start the car, and then you leave it. And then when we stopped off at Starbucks, because we navigated to Costa first of all for the first meet point, and then to Starbucks to get a proper coffee. Um, don't really like Costa and that Costa had terrible reviews online so we went up the road to, to the Starbucks um, after we went to the Costa meet point nobody else was there but you know we said we'd meet there so we've got to be fair to other people and um, and so yeah so while we were there we um, while we were there we then changed the location in the GPS so as it, uh, it's now set for civil aerodrome um, and you do that before you drive it's sensible anyway it's going to be very interesting to see how these new rules affect or are going to affect in the future these cars with these whacking great touch pads in them because they are a deviation they, they're a massive distraction and they are very dangerous in my opinion because you you apart from anything else they're not very sensitive so they don't work they're not as interactive the membranes on the screens aren't as interactive and aren't as sensitive as items like iPhones so you you know sometimes when you touch them they don't actually respond and the CPUs in them are quite low spec so they're, they're not fast acting so I think they're I think they're a major distraction and then there's going to be some legislation against using screens in the future I don't think that would be a bad thing because I hate those sort of electronics in supercars anyway I don't think they should be in supercars navigation systems yes Apple Airplay yes but full controls and be able to move your seat forwards and backwards air conditioning through a multi-functional interface is massive distraction and in my in my impression in my perception is dangerous to have in a car while you're driving and then it dates the car very very quickly especially a supercar that is going to have um, a lot of value retention in going forward in its lifeline anyway we're driving now um, on a on a motorway, I'm not quite sure what motorway we're on at the moment, but we're driving on a motorway anyway. On the way to Sewell, we've got about 80 miles to go yet. Um, in wet mode, I'll actually move it up to sport mode now because the roads are dry. Um, it's a drier area where we are, and it's not raining. And um, the car's, you know, fine, no problems. It's, it's uh, in sport mode now, so it's out of bumpy road because I'm moving it to sport. Um, it was in bumpy road mode automatically when it was in wet mode, so now we're in sport mode and the car's fine, very comfortable. These race seats that my car has, very, very comfortable. They, they hug you around your kidneys, they really hold you well. The, the driving position is fantastic with the, uh, with the um, electronic, uh, with the motorised steering system that allows you to set the steering position very, very accurately. The driving position is great, you know, there's, there's no issues whatsoever. We're just uh, going to be coming off here at Northampton. So just got to slow down a bit. Concentrate on driving, as you'd expect. Going to be turning uh, right here as well. I'm leaving the car, by the way, I'm leaving the car in auto mode for most of this journey. Why is that? Well, why not? You know, I want. We want to have a relaxed journey. Excuse me. We want to have a relaxed journey into Sewell. I've just left the car in auto mode. Um, it works very, very well in that mode. There's no issues whatsoever. All modern supercars have worked very well in their normal auto mode. 
Um, no need to switch it out into manual mode for journeys like this. Yeah, if you're, if you're with a few other cars, you want a bit of fun, then yeah, switch it to manual mode so you use the paddle shifts. But most of this journey is going to be, <coughs> excuse me, most of this journey is going to be in uh, with the car in auto mode, but it's fine, no issues whatsoever. And the cars, I say, very comfortable. The suspension, even if even though we have got bumpy road mode on, very comfortable, no issues whatsoever. Um, the only thing I'd say is that when you're driving um, a supercar like this, especially Ferraris, um, I, I think pretty much Lamborghinis are, are very much the same as well. Um, but your the steering is very fast, so that's great for when you're driving a supercar and you're you're driving on very darty roads. Um, and you're very, driving on very you know a lot a lot of um, twisty roads where, to, where you want to be able to dart forwards and backwards very quickly and you want the car to turn in very very quickly um, for this sort of driving you could do with a little bit of a slower rack uh, when I say rack I mean steering rack um, so you could do with the, with the steering being a little bit slower not quite as fast as it is and by the way when I say fast what fast what a fast steering rack means is that when you turn the steering wheel there's quite a lot of movement or, it, or it's very edgy on the on the wheels so the wheels turn very sharply and it's uh, being fast means that there's very little turns end to end of the steering wheel to actually turn the, the to turn the wheels lock to lock full lock to lock so yeah so that's um, another comment there that it would be it would be great if the steering was just not as quite as fast as it is um, so that uh, so that it would relax you a bit more because really with these supercars you've got to have both hands on the steering wheel all the time um, and when I'd say that I mean obviously you should have both hands on the steering wheel anyway but I mean at the top so you're ready for action all the time as opposed to sort of down here being re more relaxed because the you know with the car being so twitchy it's not too bad on dual carriageway like this you can drive like this but when you're on um, you know where you're turning corners going round roundabouts quite a bit you have to have your hands up here so as you can act really quickly because you've got to be able to fine-tune the steering because it's so fast but that, that's not really neg a, ne a massive negative it's just a negative on a long journey and it, it would be nice if you could change the mode of the steering um, into a slower rack uh, mode to you know when to, to cool to calm it down a little bit um, not a major problem not a major deal break or anything on these long journeys but it, it'd be a nice to have but yeah very relaxing um, when you can get the stereo to work we use them in free streaming devices you know if you haven't if you haven't seen that then check out my my um, video on my on the infotainment system we stream music from my iPhone to an in free Bluetooth device to the infotainment system on the 458 don't bother trying to use the interface on the 458 for music it's just a massive pain in the ass buy yourself a hundred pound in free uh, Bluetooth streaming device for these cars plug it into your 30 pin socket if you've got the iPod or OEM option if that's been optioned when the car, car was purchased which most of them have and it uh, resolves all your music problems just makes it a lot easier so with the infotainment system on um, just driving the car say we're in sport mode at the moment seats really really comfortable no problem whatsoever you know we did this journey last week to Sewell for the for the supercar fest the runway and you know we know what this journey is like in this car so it was obviously you know pretty much the same it's, it's the same now as it was last week um, but we're trying to give you sort of live feedback as, as I think as I'm driving you know, what the actual car is like just got a Cayman coming down on the right hand side got a nice deep blue one Even though the car's not in bumpy road at the moment and there is a bit of an undulating surface here on this dual carriageway, it's not too bad. You know, there's nothing wrong with the normal sports suspension and with it in sport mode without bumpy road mode on. It's fine. It's only when you've got really bad roads, which we've got a lot of on the B roads in the UK, especially around where I live in the countryside, it's only then that you really need to have bumpy road mode on. But it's fine at the moment, you know, no problems whatsoever. The brakes now, now moving on to the brakes, that is an interesting one. The more you use the brakes on a journey, the better they get, and that's because the 458, um, and that's because the 458 carbon ceramic discs 
aren't the best. And when I say that, I mean they're great if you're on the track and you get them super red hot. But with regards to, um, I'm just gonna switch it to bumpy road now actually because this part of the dual carriageway is, is pretty poor. Um, but when you're driving on, on, a, on a normal road, the brakes are, are not very, they're not confident inspiring at all, the brakes. It's not, they're not great. You have to really stamp on them and you get used to them after driving the car. You get to realize that once you get some heat to them, they get better. And in effect, they get better the hotter they are. In my opinion, the 458 shouldn't have been optioned by default with carbon ceramic discs. There's no need for them. Steel would have been fine. It's just Ferrari, you know. Put carbon ceramics on there because it's a Ferrari. They're optioned on, I believe, on every single Ferrari now. I don't believe there's a possibility to option steel. There is an option to actually replace them with steel, um, but you don't want to do that, really. Um, and if you do do that, then you want to put them back to carbon ceramics afterwards, or at least provide the carbon ceramics. So, yeah, they're not very confident inspiring. So another thing that would be better is if they had steel discs. Um, you know, that, that would be a lot better. Yes, it doesn't look as cool, and yes, you get more brake dust with, with, um, with steel discs because the pad material you use, a different type of pad material, obviously, um, and that creates a lot more brake dust. But, you know, they're just not great. And yeah, you've got approaches where you can um, take the glaze off the carbon ceramic disc by going through certain techniques and certain approaches of braking in certain sequences, braking very, very hard. Uh, to be able to take the glaze off the discs, but after a short while, they, they get glazed again because pretty much the carbon ceramic material is designed for track use. Now with the Speciali, the 458 Speciali, both the Aperta and the Coupe, they have a different composite material in the carbon ceramic discs, and they are a lot more improved, so I've been told. I haven't driven a Speciali yet, but my aim is to get into a Speciali, Speciali to drive one, and I'll give you some feedback then, but from everybody I hear, they are a lot better. So they've really, they've resolved the problem in the 458 Speciali. So it's a shame that they couldn't convert that and port them over onto the 458. I suspect if you want to, you can put the 458 Speciali carbon ceramics on the 458 uh, normal cars. But it's very expensive to change the carbon ceramics on these, it's around 20 to 25,000 pounds to change all the carbon ceramics. So, unless you're wealthy and you really need the, the change of carbon ceramics, you really need the change of carbon of uh, braking configuration, you ain't gonna put, you ain't gonna spend 20, 25 grand just for the sake of it. So, th that's the thought, you know, the, the brakes could be, could be better if they're steel, but they're okay. There are no, no real problems with the brakes, you just gotta understand and know the brakes that they have to be really hot to be really functional uh, and they're not very confident inspiring when they're cold which is most of the time in regards to normal driving like this now in regards to road noise that's an interesting one now that i've got the pirelli p0s on this car and they're not the newest of tires they're the original tires and i'm going to change them over to michelin pilot sports mps 4s they call them I'm, I think I've, I've mentioned in one of my other videos that I'm having problems at the moment trying to source K1s, which are the Ferrari variant for the front. You can get them for the back, but for the 295s on the back, but you can't get them for the 235s on the front, so I'm going to have to try and decide what I'm going to do for the fronts. Um, nothing wrong with the tread on these these tyres. The tread is fine. Nothing, they're, they're not splitting either. They're not showing any signs of deterioration, but you've got to be careful with older tyres. Um, so, with the Pirelli P0s, you get a fair amount of road noise transmitted through the tyres. I believe that's a lot better in the Michelin Pilot Sport 4S. Um, and I believe we're converting over to a 5S soon, so you know we'll see what they're like. I'll try and get some 5Ss on it. But um, there's, there's a fair amount of road noise, but it's not really, it's not annoying, it's not distracting, it's not unrelaxing, you know, it's quite a relaxing drive. It's not causing me major problems, but you can, there is some road noise that comes up. So I think that will get improved with changing over to Michelin Pilot Sports. I think it's just Pirelli P0s. Uh, but it's a supercar at the end of the day, so you're gonna get some noise transmitted. And the cars like the Speciali, 
uh, coupe and aperta, you're going to get more road noise because the sound deadening is removed from those cars or a substantial amount of sound deadening is removed. So they're going to be a lot noisier. Um, but it's not bad at all. And I've got the, the valves open at the moment on the exhaust, so it's a bit noisier. So if I was to switch the valves closed, you see it quiets down a little bit because I'm not over the RPM for the valves to open. So it's not too bad at all. And, and with regards to the, the um, dynamics, the air dynamics of the car, I just switch it back into yob mode, as they say, on the exhaust. <coughs> with regards to the aerodynamics of the car noise, it's, it's very streamlined, it's got very good aer aerodynamics coefficient, so it's, it's not noisy at all with regards to wind, so no problems whatsoever, the wipers don't, you know, the wipers aren't in front of the wind, they're actually closed wipe, they're actually locked right down, close to the body, um, so as they're not going to be inducing any, any noise from wind, uh, by wind interacting with them. So yeah, it's a great place to be, I mean, the 458 really is a modern day supercar, and it, it really is reliable, a, modern, a reliable modern day supercar and it really is a comfortable modern day supercar for doing longest journeys. It's only the, it's only the mileage sensitivity on these cars that prevents people from doing long journeys in these cars, I'm sure of it. That is the main hindrance to doing long journeys in these cars, is, is the fact that they're, they're flipping mileage sensitive and therefore Everybody's worried about putting miles on them to retain the value, and especially as the, the, the values of these cars are going up at the moment, it causes more of a problem with regards to value retention. It just is, you know, this bloody mileage sensitivity shit. I'm sure everybody who owns a supercar that isn't super wealthy, and even the super wealthy ones, they'd wish for sure that this mileage sensitivity situation did not exist. They'd wish it wasn't a thing with Ferraris. It isn't so much a thing with Porsches. It just is with Ferraris and Lamborghinis, but mostly with Ferraris. It is what it is, but it's bloody annoying. So with regards to using the controls for a long journey, so when I say the controls, the, the navigation controls, indicators, um, horn not so much because you don't use a horn that much, Manatino, wipers, but well, we've been using the wipers quite a bit. Yeah, the wipers button is a pain in the ass to have this multi-function single button on the steering wheel. But to be fair, once you get used to it, it's actually very easy to use. Just press it once, puts it into auto mode, press it, pull it, it switches it off. Um, for a quick wipe, you pull it once, it does a quick wipe. It's um, quite logical. So there's no issues really with that. And the indicators, you get used to them. Yeah, it's a pain in the backside with regards to having to hold it. Um, to do a, a lane to, to do a lane change indication and so actually just press it once to hold the indicator on those that causes problems and, and in the later cars from the 488 onwards it is it has been reversed round which is logical how it should be so in the, in the later cars you press the button quickly and it does a lane change which by lane change I mean it just flashes the indicators a, a few times so it gives you enough flashes to change lane on the motorway or on the dual carriageway and then if you hold the button down for us like about a second second and a half then it holds the it latches the indicators on until you switch them off or until you've turned the corner and it automatically self cancels but uh, the steering wheel is comfortable the ergonom ergonomics of the steering wheel Schumacher got it right no problems whatsoever with that it would be nice if the horn was in the middle because it's still logical to press a horn in the middle where the airbag is but you get used to it. Um, you've got to be very, very specific with the horn on this because there's very, very specific buttons that you've got to press. Um, so if you want to interact with the horn very, very quickly, if you want to gauge the horn very, very quickly, you're probably going to miss it the first time, which isn't ideal, but there you go. Moving on to the efficiency of the car. When I say efficiency, I'm talking about cost, so miles per gallon, really. Yeah, it's a supercar, so it's going to drink fuel to a certain extent, you know, it's, it's not a daily driver from, with respect to the mileage consumption. And this trip to Sewell, this is going to cost around 50, 55 pounds in fuel. So that's 100 miles, 50 to 55 pounds. So the whole end-to-end -end journey, but you know, it's a bit less than that to be honest. So probably around 80 to 90 pounds to do 100 miles. Um, that's not too bad. It's not so bad as supercars go. You know, if you're in an 812 um, GTS, if you're in an 812, 
if you're in an 812 Superfast or GTS, that's going to be a lot worse, I can assure you, a lot, lot worse, because V12. So, it's not as bad as it could be. It's not too bad. And it's, it's acceptable, I would say, with regards to the fact that you're driving a supercar. You know, it's not going to be a thrifty, it's not going to be thrifty on fuel, is it? If you're driving a, a V8 supercar, you know, they're highly tuned and they're not going to be tuned for um, fuel economy. It's just how it is. And obviously, the fuel that you put in is the higher octane variants, E5 or better. Um, so you're going to run into a 95% of underleaded and 5% 5% max of ethanol is generally what people put into these cars. You can put E10 in it, but you don't really want to. You want to put E5 in there. By the way, E5 means um, the E5 stands for 5% ethanol. So in effect, it means that the fuel has a maximum of 5% ethanol and a minimum of 95% unleaded. And obviously with the way how the world is moving, we're going to be moving towards more of an ethanol based in fuel um, and less of unleaded. As we're moving obviously towards the, the pinnacle point of 2030, no, no petrol cars will be, able, will be able to be manufactured and sold anymore. So it's going to be very interesting to see how the supercar manufacturers deal with that, like Lamborghini, Ferrari, McLaren, etc. I know they have to be providing then electric cars. They're, they're all providing or are moving towards hybrid cars. Lamborghini, not so much <laughs> at the moment, but obviously Ferrari moving towards hybrid with the 296 and the SF90. Uh, so they're going to be providing electric cars by that time. Then it'll come down to, you know, you all the cars will be electric, so it'll come down to, um, you know, do you want a Ferrari electric car? Do you want a Ferrari electric supercar? Or do you want a McLaren electric supercar? Or do you want a Lamborghini electric supercar? That was pretty much what it would come down to. I'm sure I'm, I'm missing off loads of different marks there, but they're the, 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 the most well-known brands. So we're going to close out the video now. Hopefully that information is very, very useful for you, especially for prospective supercar purchasers. This sort of information isn't provided anywhere else, so I hope that's been very useful for you. It's something that I couldn't find anywhere when I was looking to buy a supercar. If you've enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up, give it a like. So we've got loads of future content to come for you. Thanks a lot for watching the videos, guys. We've got a lot of people who aren't subscribed, so please think about subscribing. It does make a difference. We've got around 85% of our subscribers. We've got about around 85% of our viewers that aren't subscribed. It would be really great if, if some of you guys could convert over to being subscribed. It would really help the channel. Thanks a lot for watching, guys, and we'll catch you in the next video.